हरे कृष्ण आई वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू फोक लाइफ वी हैव अ वेरी ब्रांड न्यू एपिसोड ऑफ फ्रैंकली स्पीकिंग विथ हिज ग्रेस स्वेक्त नरसिम्हा प्रभु इन दिस पर्टिकुलर एपिसोड ही इज क्लियरिंग ऑल दोज फंडामेंटल डाउट्स वॉट वी जनरली हैड और हैव about Lord Ramachandra Mother Parvati and many other great personalities in Ramayana and Mahabharat please do watch this podcast till the end and i have one more humble request to all of you please if you have any questions doubts regarding any of such great personalities even even otherwise please post those question in the comment section and i assure you these questions will be answered by our next guest on the frankly speaking episode please put your questions and doubts in the comment sections and please don't forget to watch this frankly speaking episode with his grace swet narsimha prabhu till end on popular demand his grace swet narsimha prabhu has agreed to give us valuable time for all of us folks welcome you prabhu for once again it's a privilege and honor to have you on frankly speaking once again thank you so much hare krishna the <laughs> pleasure is all mine <laughs> yeah prabhu this time uh, we would well into the most uh, controversial topics per se mm-hmm. say mahabharat and ramayan has been lifeline of the very indian tradition either mm-hmm. politics or sports or any, any family disputes we take kurukshetra as examples <laughs> or uh, uh, Ramana, Ra- Ramana's example or Ramana's example. Mm. So the one of the primary question which uh, the Indians at large or the world at large has is why Mother Sita had to go mm. through what she had to go through. Mm. Even Lord Ramachandra, being the supreme Lord, had made her go through those troubles and hardships. Mm. Why? Well, uh, she had to be abducted by Ravana. She had to um uh, for so many days she had to uh, spend in separation from her husband even before that uh, when lord rama went into the forest in exile she had to accompany him and undergo all those hardships isn't it yes generally it's like a patriarchy mm. like only men enjoy and the women had to suffer mm. yeah well um uh, i think uh, that may be taking it a little too far because Uh, whatever suffering uh, sita maya underwent lord rama also equally suffered uh, it was not that sita was sent alone to the forest mm-hmm. in fact we all know how uh, the demand from kaikeyi was that lord rama should be sent to the forest she had nothing to say about sita devi mm-hmm. and uh, lord rama also when he was uh, going to the forest in exile he uh, told sita to uh, he he did not want her to accompany him but it was sita who insisted that she wanted to go with him so it was her insistence it was not that the forest exile was imposed upon her mm. number 1 number 2 we also have to understand that who wanted the forest exile was it uh, dacharatha no no was it lord rama no. no was it bharata no no then who wanted it kai kai woman yes, right woman. so where is <laughs> so where is patriarchy there in okay. fact Kaikeyi had the greater say than her husband. Mm. Dasharatha did not want to send Lord Rama. Yes. He wanted to coronate uh, Lord Ramachandra. It's a But different it was, angle of vision. <laughs> But it was Kaikeyi who made the condition that he has to go to the forest. Mm. And then Lord Rama, as a male, as a husband, he told Sita that I am going to the forest. But it was Sita who insisted that she also wanted to accompany, and Rama had to accede to that. So. whose wish is predominating here the woman's or the man's it wow, is the woman <laughs> <laughs> so where is patriarchy there and uh, as far as uh, the actually what we have to understand is lord ramachandra is not an ordinary human being he is the supreme personality of god it incarnate in the into this material world and like lord krishna also says in the bhagavad gita dharma sanstapana arthaya whenever abhyutthanam adharmasya whenever there is an increase in irreligion or irreligious practices or somebody uh, becomes very prominent who uh, who who is an adharmic person who is an irreligious person who creates havoc in the society then what happens is the lord incarnates to reestablish dharma and set right the things 
this is the normally the scheme of things the normally the reason why the lord descends so lord rama also descended for that purpose it's not that lord rama took birth like us because of karma we are not in control of our births we did not choose our parents we did not choose when we will take birth we did not even choose whether i should be born a male or a female when you say the lord chooses all this the things. lord chooses himself he chooses whom he has to uh, accept as his parents he chooses when he has to descend so the lord comes to execute his own purpose not for undergoing the uh, reactions of his past karma mm-hmm. we are born not not because we want to fulfill some purpose here we are born because our old reactions our old karma is forcing us to take birth isn't it correct so the lord descends not because uh, not out of the force of karma and kala out of the force of time and the reactions of one's activities but he descends for his own purpose so the lord uh, when he descends he wants to execute various uh, activities in relationship with his devotees paritranaya sadhuna so both activities are there when the lord incarnates he has to uh, he has to vanquish the demoniac people and the demoniac principles at the same time because this world is filled with not only demoniac people it is also filled with devotees of the lord so the lord comes first to exchange loving relationship with his devotees if i have to in- interfere yes. you said the purpose of the lord no just to add a little catalyst into your question answering the purpose of the lord was to make sure that mother sita had to go through those difficult days she had to be uh, <laughs> put in a difficult condition she was pregnant she was carrying when she was asked to go yes uh, so please continue so yeah so uh, i will come to that i'll come to that i'm coming to that only so what happens is the lord comes to exchange a loving relationship with his devotees and in the course of exchanging loving relationship with his devotees he also vanquishes the demonic people and principles now you we have to understand lord rama incarnated as the son of dasharath maharaj in ayodhya now his devotees are not limited only to ayodhya lord ramachandra's devotees are there everywhere uh, hanuman is waiting there in the in the south of india waiting for lord ramachandra to come for him to render his services shabari is waiting for lord ramachandra kishkinda uh, sugriva angada jambavan they are all great devotees of the lord they are waiting to render some service to the lord uh, vibhishana again a devotee of the lord he also wants to render service to the lord okay. so how will the render engage them in his service he has to create a situation where they get an opportunity to render service now of course again the question comes that if the lord wants to take service from them why not create a happy situation mm. a very happy just like if i want to mm. exchange some good uh, uh, you know uh, activities with my friends mm. i don't create a fight mm. what i do i throw a party mm. let us go to the movie Correct. do something enjoyable Correct. so why does lord ramachandra have have to create a situation where sita maya is abducted yes. and he is in so much pain she is also in so, so much pain, pain. and the fighting war all these things why does he have to create all the this ramayana is full of such tragedies yes the moment we know it's going to be happy again the tragedy the moment again happy that's tragedy. exactly so now the point is when the lord when krishna when he has to exchange a loving relationship with his devotees he exchanges loving relationship with his devotees in the mood that they want to serve him mm-hmm. so what happens is there are primarily four rasas four melos in which a devotee exchanges loving relationship with the lord one is dar- dasya rasa the mood of servitude so somebody likes to serve the lord as his master so there are personalities like hanuman then there are those who want to act like the friend of the lord sakya rasa fraternal relationship so there are uh, various personality who strike a friendship with lord ramachandra then there are those who want to serve the lord in 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 a paternal affection mm-hmm. so they like dasharath maharaj kausalya uh, all these personalities they want to serve the lord in the mood of his uh, in the mood of a parent so the lord gives them also an opportunity mm-hmm. and then there are there are personalities who want to serve the lord in a conjugal mood and that is how sita maya get that opportunity mm-hmm. so the lord exchanges uh, lord engages in activities in the mood in which the devotees want to relate with him 
you mean to say mother sita wants to enjoy conjugal relation in that such pain <laughs> <laughs> not exactly i'll yeah. come to that also now what happens is personalities like hanuman sugriva jambavan they are all mm. warrior personalities when they want to serve the lord they don't want to come carrying one plate for the lord give one cup of water uh, serve some juice you know that doesn't that doesn't inspire them mm. what inspires is fight for the lord so the lord has to create a situation where they have to express their love for uh, lord ramachandra by fighting for him so how how to create that situation and there and also simultaneous you see the lord when he descends he doesn't fulfill only one purpose he ful fulfills many purposes the lord also wanted to relieve the burden on the earth which had been created by ravana mm -hmm. ravana and all his cohorts mm -hmm. it was not ravana alone there were so many people kumbhakarna and others who were also helping him now the lord wanted to diminish the burden on the earth because of all these personalities so what the lord ramachandra did he created a situation where ravana abducted mm -hmm. sita devi and it became an opportunity for all these devotees of uh, lord ramachandra like sugriva jambavan hanuman all of them to express their love for lord ramachandra by engaging in that battle you said lord created the situation yes and means abduction of his wife was also created by the lord in then the opportunity was given ravana had the free will to not do it or to do it uh -huh. when the situation is there now if lord, if ravana had decided not to abduct sita devi the whole war would not have happened uh -huh. but the 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 lord you see krishna also in the bhagavad gita he tells arjuna after giving all the instructions to arjuna at the end what did lord krishna tell arjuna ethe chasi tatha kuru now i had to instruct you in whatever way i had i had to now i leave it to you what you want to do mm -hmm. so the lord respects our free will mm -hmm. so when when we speak of free will free will means there is the choice is in our hand whether we want to do the right thing or the wrong thing in every situation we have an opportunity to do a right thing or a wrong thing because ravana had engaged in so many atrocious activities naturally he took the wrong path mm -hmm. he took the he misused his free will mm -hmm. and he abducted sita devi mm -hmm. and so naturally that created because so that created the opportunity for uh, hanuman and all mm -hmm. others to serve lord ramachandra now coming to the coming to the question why sita devi had to become mm -hmm. Uh, subjected to that why she had to undergo that now the lord he wants to teach us multiple lessons mm -hmm. through his personal life it is said that in when a man and a woman come together in a loving relationship that relationship is always the cause of trouble in this material world <laughs> so the lord by his personal example and the example of sita devi wanted to establish that relationship between a man and a woman in a conjugal relationship whether licit or illicit whether as husband and wife or lover or live in relationship whatever relationship it is it is bound to create misery is this the message of ramayana what you mean to say this is one of the messages one of the of message of the lord wants okay. to teach us multiple one things one of the message <laughs> the lord wants us to wants to teach us multiple things so the first teaching of lord rama is that even if you have a properly le legally wedded wife even then that union also will create miseries for you in this material world that's evident because what was krishna what is krishna's teaching in the bhagavad gita dukkhalayam achashvatam this material world is a place of misery and normally what happens is when we have when we are young there is lot of uh, 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 hot blood in our uh, this one what happens we have lot of idealism when we are young when we are stepping out of our teens mm -hmm. when we are becoming adolescents what happens we have a lot of idealism i'll be like this i'll be like that i will have a lover and we will have an eternal relationship you know <laughs> and i will i will earn so much money and i will enjoy like this i will enjoy like that i can see my parents are always fighting i'll not be like them i you know i have figured it out how i can enjoy in life you know lord rama teaches by his personal example it will not work this material world is a place of bhagwan ho ke khud wo aise the lord uh, being the supreme personality of god he is showing how he, even though you may be very powerful mm. you may have a very a very uh, chaste loving partner you may have 
knowledge. You may have everything at your disposal. You may be very intelligent, very beautiful, very powerful, very loving family, very loving parents, very loving uh, wife, husband, all these things may be there. Still, this material world will create situations of misery for you. You can never be happy in this material world. Never be happy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you really want to be happy, only way is to render devotional service to Krishna and go back to God. Mm -hmm. So, that's the only way to become really happy. So, that's one of the important messages mm -hmm. that the Lord wants to give us through the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. Now, another aspect of this uh, pastime of Ramayana, what we have to understand is, that when there is a conjugal relationship, when there is a relationship between a lover and a beloved or a husband and a wife, when they are together, when the two lovers are together, there is a certain kind of happiness in that relationship. Now, when two lovers go far apart and then there are many obstacles in the path of their coming to meet, coming together to meet again, and there is a long time gap between their meeting, when all those obstacles are removed, and when they, when they both come back together, the joy of the relationship increases multifold. This is naturally the way how loving relationship develop. So the Lord, Lord Ramachandra, Sita Devi is his eternal consort. She is always with him. She can never be separated from him. So the Lord creates situations where there is separation, apparent separation created. And when they come back together, they enjoy greater happiness in that union when they come back together. You mean to say the intensity of separation is also a joyful experience for the Lord and the concept? It, it is, it is, it creates the bliss of joining together once again. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a yearning, when will I see my lover? When will I see my beloved? When will I get back to, uh, with her or him again? So there is a rasa in that anticipation also. Mm -hmm. So when Lord Ramachandra is walking, he is going step by step towards Lanka, he is meeting Jatayu, he is meeting Hanuman. All this one by one, what is happening? He is coming closer and closer to achieving his goal of, get, goal of getting back to Sita. Emotionally, like to the trees, to the plants. Have you seen Sita? Yes. So, that is called Viraha, technically. Mm -hmm. the, the bliss of separation. Mm -hmm. So, for the Lord, although in this material world, Dukkhalayam Asaswatam, every relationship is a cause of distress in this material world. When it comes to Lord Ramachandra and Sita, externally it, it might look like they are experiencing distress. Mm -hmm. But in reality, mm -hmm. in the spiritual world, mm -hmm. even those moments of distress actually create greater ecstasy. Mm -hmm. So, there is a rasa in that separation also from the beloved. Mm -hmm. Because that separation creates opportunity for an anticipation mm -hmm. that soon I will meet, meet my beloved. And that anticipation creates greater happiness than in actually meeting. <laughs> this answers the question of Kerala's story where the Asifa asked this question, what kind of lord he sees looking for his wife, he can't protect his wife. The mood <laughs> is expressed by, you know, wonderful. It's bro. not that the lord is, uh, uh, he cannot protect his wife or he cannot search for his wife. Mm. He wants to give an opportunity for his devotees to mm. serve him. If the lord were to do everything by himself, actually, the uh, Lord Ramachandra does not have to cross the ocean, mm. go there, fight with Ravana. He doesn't have to do anything. Just by his will, Ravana will drop dead. Yes. <laughs> Just by his will, you know, when Lord Ramachandra went to the shore of the ocean, there is a there is a temple where Lord Ramachandra fasted. He fasted for a few days, I think three days three or days. Mm. three days he fasted. So that place where he fasted, there is a beautiful temple of Lord Rama. And there they have inscribed, actually what happened was, Lord Rama sat there waiting for Sagara to come and give a, give a way how to cross over the ocean and go to Lanka. Why he had to do that if he is a lord? He wanted to take service from the Samudra, from Sagara. He wanted to give an opportunity for Sagara to serve him mm -hmm. and create an opportunity for all the Vanaras also to render service for him. So the lord was waiting for three days. And three days, the, the ocean personified, he didn't turn up. Then Lord Ramachandra became angry. His eyes turned copper red and his eyebrows rose. What happened? This much only. His mm. eyebrows rose and his eyes became copper red. What happened? The, all the water in the ocean started boiling. Mm. All the whales, sharks, all the huge, small, all fishes, they all started, you know, they, they could not, they, they became completely agitated. The water of the ocean is boiling. 
in no time the water would have evaporated and the ocean would have come a completely barren place the, the ocean personified he came running to lord ramachandra with various paraphernalia mm. and said oh my lord forgive me i forgive me i i i uh, made a mistake i could not recognize your lordship and i neglected your order so please tell me what service i can render to you so then lord ramachandra said you know i want to cross over to lanka tell me how to do it mm. so the lord ramachandra if he can boil an ocean just by raising his mm. raising his eyebrows uh, how long does it take him, him to kill uh, ramana not a big deal mm. but then lord ramachandra wanted to give an opportunity like i said for sugriva jambavan all of them to exert their bodily strength and feel satisfaction in having helped the ramachandra served ramachandra in getting back sita devi so therefore the lords the lord he can do anything by his simply willing but then the lord wants to also engage in loving relationship with his devotees so therefore it's not that lord ramachandra was incapable of getting back sita devi or killing ravana by himself all he had to do was raise his eyebrow and simply by his will this whole material universe is created and it is destroyed mm-hmm. so simply by willing he does this mm-hmm. you can imagine that's the power of the lord so what we have to understand is the lord uh, lord ramachandra being the supreme personality of godhead has no need to go undergo all these attempts and endeavors all that he has to do all that he has to do is simply will and things will happen but we have to understand that he still does these things to give an opportunity for his devotees to engage in loving devotional service to him otherwise what is the need for lord ramachandra to come to this material world at all he can stay in ayodhya in the spiritual world with sita devi and constantly enjoy with her mm-hmm. but he comes here still mm-hmm. to give an opportunity for everyone to serve him and to become purified and to be able to go back to god and through this way mm-hmm. so that's the purpose of the lord's descent and so naturally he he acts in such a way as if he is unable to do things on his own and he needs the help of others mm-hmm. but in reality that's not the fact mother sita i'm waiting for the answer why she had to go through the difficulties yes so like i mentioned when the lord has to perform all these different uh, past times naturally the the you know sita devi is also part of the the whole uh, program of the lord and we have to also understand that lord krishna or lord ramachandra they uh, feel greater pleasure when their devotees are glorified when hanuman is glorified lord ramachandra feels greater happiness when the sita devi is glorified lord ramachandra feels greater happiness now the glories of a personality can be brought out when not in happy circumstances mm. the real character of a person is seen in how he handles difficult situations if everything everything is joyous everything is happy then the real character of the person cannot be known it is when there are difficulties that the real character of the person comes shining forth we look at prahlad maharaj how much difficulty he had to undergo the pandavas they had to undergo so much difficulty despite being great devotees of the lord so but then the lord has a plan he knows that what level of difficulty what level of distress his devotees can undertake they are capable of undertaking and he wants to demonstrate to the world that despite such great difficulties how his devotees are always devoted to him they never for once is their faith shaken even a, even by a millimeter when they undergo all kinds of distressful conditions sita devi despite going through so much turmoil and distress never once did her heart even for a second forget lord ramachandra's lotus feet so that's the glory of uh, sita devi today why sita devi is revered so much glorified so much because she underwent all those distressful conditions and because of that her name is glorified like this so in in participating in the leelas of the lord in the past times of the lord she has to play a certain role and she plays that role to perfection not only that in in playing that role whatever difficult situations come out the, in agni that pariksha. agni pariksha yes those kind of situations come when those things come that is when the real character of the person shines forth and that is what the lord also becomes happy about mm. 
I I also heard that in Kurma Purana, Mother Sita was actually not abducted. It was Chaya Sita or Maya Sita. What is the yes. story about it? Well, actually, uh, you know that story is related to the Agni Pariksha. Mm. What you were asking mm. also. So generally, we we get this question that why Lord Ramachandra sub, subjected Sita Devi mm. to the Agni Pariksha. So this is a male chauvinistic, uh, mm. you know, all those kind of things. First of all, the point is. that lord ramachandra never asked sita devi to undergo agni pariksha who oh, is it did he ask her oh. i am asking you you think she was, he asked her <laughs> generally the understanding that is, is the biggest lie you have come across oh. <laughs> i'll come to that later now what exactly happened i'll come to that later now actually chaitanya mahaprabhu 500 years ago he was he was staying after sanyas after he took sanyas in 1510 ad he was staying in jagannath puri and uh, he went on a tour of different places vrindavan and uh, other you know prayag and south india for about 6 years so during that time chaitanya mahaprabhu came to south india and when he came to south india chaitanya mahaprabhu visited ahobilam mm. that is in andhra pradesh and various places like that he also came to tamil nadu in tamil nadu chaitanya mahaprabhu came to madurai in madurai there is a river which is today known as vaigai those days it used to be known as kritamala so chaitanya mahaprabhu came to madurai and he took bath in the vaigai river and uh, normally whenever wherever chaitanya mahaprabhu would go he would stay in the house of some brahmana because brahmanas those days all the brahmanas would have salagrama sila and uh, uh, the the if he stayed in the brahmana's house he can get vishnu prasadam so that was his intention in uh, madurai he came across one brahmana old elderly brahmana by the name of ramadasa vipra this ramadasa vipra he invited chaitanya mahaprabhu your sanyasi because those days wherever a sanyasi would go any grahastha he would invite him to his house and make him stay there and as long as the sanyasi stayed he could uh, all his necessities would be taken care of chaitanya Mah- so this ramadasa vipra invited chaitanya mahaprabhu why don't you come and stay with me chaitanya mahaprabhu came and stayed with him in the morning chaitanya mahaprabhu went to vaigai to take bath and he came back by about noon time to ramadasa vipra's house now when ramadasa vipra's house chaitanya mahaprabhu came he asked him what time is prasadam ramadasa vipra replied lakshmana has gone to the forest to get the roots and vegetables from the forest after he comes back sita devi will cook and after that we can all have prasadam <laughs> he was so much absorbed in lord rama's past times he was meditating constantly on all those activities of lakshmana sita maiya ramachandra that he was thinking he he was so much absorbed that he was actually practically in that leela so he was thinking you know lakshmana has to come back with all the vegetables otherwise how cooking can happen how sita maiya can cook chaitanya mahaprabhu also became very happy when he heard this oh this devotee is so absorbed in rama's leela that he has forgotten his current reality the, the material reality that he is in he is practically living in with lord ramachandra chaitanya mahaprabhu was very happy 12 o'clock became 1 o'clock 1 o'clock became 2 o'clock <laughs> 2 o'clock became 3 o'clock nothing is happening then suddenly this man got up oh lakshmana has come back and fatafat he did some cooking offered to uh, salagram sila and then offered the prasadam to mahaprabhu mahaprabhu also very happily honored that prasadam then after that mahaprabhu saw this brahmana ramadasa vipra he was sitting quietly in one place and he was crying Uh, mahaprabhu asked him why don't you have your prasadam he said how can i have prasadam that uh, wretch that uh, asura ravana he has kidnapped sita maiya and how I, i am not able to digest how that fellow he can touch the body of sita maiya i'm not able to digest it and this is give me so much pain that i want to go and commit suicide i don't want to eat and so like this he was fasting and refusing to eat then chaitanya mahaprabhu spoke to him convinced him and managed somehow to make him eat otherwise he would have left his body and chaitanya mahaprabhu told him don't worry you know there are the lord has his purposes behind all these things so don't worry and mahaprabhu managed to convince him and then mahaprabhu went further down south on his pilgrimage and then mahaprabhu went to different places then finally he went to dhanushkoti and then he came to rameshwara in rameswaram when chaitanya mahaprabhu came some brahmanas were sitting and they were reciting the kurma purana mm-hmm. and when they were reciting the kurma purana 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also sat there and he started hearing them. And in the course of hearing the Kurma Purana, they recited two verses, which when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard, he became very happy. Mm -hmm. And he immediately told the Saman mm -hmm. to note down, to copy mm -hmm. those two verses and give it to him. Because in those days, mm -hmm. There was no scanning, there were no photocopy machines, mm. all those things were not there. The system used to be, there used to be people who are experts in writing. They would, they would, cop, they would make copies of all these scriptures mm. and uh, like Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, how do we have multiple copies of all these things today? Because those people would, in palm leaves, they would uh, keep uh, writing copies and they would keep giving it to people who are wanted it. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu got someone to uh, copy those two verses onto a palm leaf. And he took it with him. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went back to Madurai. Mm -hmm. And he went to that Ramadas Vipra and he showed him these two verses. Mm -hmm. So, what were those two verses? Sita Yaradito Vahnes Chaya Sita Aji Jamat. Sita Devi, the Kurma Purana is saying, Sita Ya Aradhitaha Vahnihi. Vahni means Agni, uh, the fire. So, the fire god was worshipped by Sita. And upon the request of Sita Devi, Sita Ya Aradhito Vahnes. Chaya Sita Maji Janat. Agni Dev, the, the Lord of Fire, he generated a Chaya Sita. Mm -hmm. A replica of Sita Devi. Mm -hmm. A shadow Sita Devi. Mm -hmm. You know, today, now in technology, we have holographic images. Mm -hmm. True. Which look exactly like exactly. the mm -hmm. original person. But under certain conditions, mm -hmm. they are not exactly the same person. So, in the olden technology, Agni Dev had a technology <laughs> which was far superior to holography and he could create a Sita Devi which looked exactly like Sita Devi in 3D yes. and in terms of <laughs> touch, feel, smell, looks, yeah. everything similar. And so, he created this and what happened? Tam Jahara Dashagrivaha. Dashagriva, the ten-headed man who is Ramana. Ramana. Tam Jahara, he took away the Chaya Sita, not the original Sita. So, what happened to the original Sita? Mm. Sita Vahni Purim Gata. Mm. She went with Agni Dev to his abode. Mm. Agni Dev took her and gave her a, a, protect, a protected environment where she could stay as long as she wished. Mm. And then what happened? The Kuruma Purana, the second verse, what it states is, so the person whom Ramana took was not the original Sita. It was a Chaya Sita. Mm. Okay. And then when, when, when uh, Pariksha Samaya, at the time of the Agni Pariksha, the question mm. that <laughs> Pariksha Samaye at the time of the Pariksha, Vahnim into that Agni, mm. which was created at the time of the Agni Pariksha, Chaya Sita Viveshasa, the Chaya Sita entered that, uh, that Agni in the Agni Pariksha. Mm. And then what happened? The Sitam Samaniya, Vahnihi Sitam Samaniya, Tat Purastat Aninayat. When Chaya Sita entered that fire, Agni Dev brought the original Sita and handed her over to Lord Ramachandra. Mm. So, this is what actually happened. So, when, when, when that Brahmana read these two verses, he became so relieved. Ah, my Sita Maya was not touched by Ravana. That fellow could not lay his hands on her. I, and after that, he became very joyful. I just remembered a statement of Prabhupada, where uh, Prabhupada says, if Krishna wants to cheat you, you will not even come to know that you are cheated. <laughs> so, Krishna, Lord Ramachandra cheated the whole world. We need yes. to know that. Yes. <laughs> so, there is a purpose why that happened. So, when we come to the, come back, coming back to the Agni Pariksha. So, what actually happened was, after the whole battle of Ramayana got over, and uh, Ravana was uh, vanquished by Lord Ramachandra, Sita Devi was brought back from that forest, and from that garden, mm, Ashokavana. And uh, she came back to Lord Ramachandra. At that time, Lord Ramachandra was eagerly waiting for Sita Maya to come. Mm. And the moment she came, he was very stiff. Mm. So, Sita Devi saw that Lord Ramachandra is not, uh, he is not expressing his happiness in seeing her. Then Lord Ramachandra told her, uh, he narrated what all had happened. How he had struggled and how he established a, uh, 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 partnership with Sugriva and then how all they all crossed over the ocean and then how they fought with Ra Ramana and finally vanquished him and now uh, Sita had been rescued. And then Lord Ramachandra said, but you have been in another's, another man's house for so long. So therefore, I cannot accept you back. Mm -hmm. 
you now that you have been rescued you feel free to go wherever you want if you want to be with lakshmana or with vibhishana or sugriva or anybody else you are most welcome i have no objection be happy wherever you are this was lord ramachandra's word this was what he told sita devi when sita devi heard that she became livid so she became livid she became angry that she was being accused of infidelity and at the same time she felt felt great pain naturally you know combination of distress and anger and tears welled in her eyes and she spoke to lord ramachandra and she said you are accusing me of uh, infidelity but when uh, ravana abducted me he caught hold of my hand made me sit on his lap all these things against my wishes i was helpless even in that circumstance not for one second did my heart flutter even a little bit from your lotus feet so i have been so i i am blameless you know i when i am helpless somebody violates me like that what can i do so i am blameless i uh, you cannot blame me like this but still you have put this allegation on me when when you have done this i and and you are refusing to take me back i do not wish to remain alive i feel like giving up my life so therefore i am telling now she turns to lakshmana she turned to lakshmana and she told please set up a pyre and set it on fire i will enter that so lakshmana when he heard this he was shocked so what is this sita devi is telling she will enter the fire then he looked at lord ramachandra and lord ramachandra also looked at him and the moment lakshmana caught lord ramachandra's eyes he understood what was going on he understood the lord's intention so he quietly went created a fire and set it on fire and then sita devi entered the blazing fire now when when this happened all the vanaras who were assembled there hanuman sugriva everybody started crying no oh, oh sita maya has entered the fire sita maya has entered the fire but before entering the fire sita devi said oh uh, agni if i have been chased if my heart has never even for one moment forgotten forgotten lord ramachandra then you please protect me and so she entered the fire like that so she did not enter to give up her life she entered the fire with the full knowledge and intention understanding the intention of lord ramachandra she entered the fire with the request to be protected if she had been chased all through so then what happened all the devatas came lord brahma came lord shiva came lord you know all the various indra everybody came because this is you know such a such a significant thing happening sita maya has entered the fire so then when they all came they all glorified lord ramachandra and then agni dev came out of the fire with sita devi so why because there were two purposes which were being achieved here one was chaya sita had to go and the original sita had to come back that was being achieved another reason that was happening lord ramachandra did not tell sita maya to enter the fire he did not tell her undergo the uh, agni pariksha so that i can know that you are chaste he did not say that he said you are free to do go with whomever you want that was that much only he told it was sita maya's own volition she chose to go through the agni pariksha like i said for two purposes one was so that the original sita should come back that was one purpose another purpose when sita maya came back came out of the fire agni dev proclaimed to everyone that sita maya is pure she is completely chaste and she is spotless her character is spotless so at that time lord ramachandra spoke to sita devi and he explained in the ramayana the valmiki ramayana this is the record lord ramachandra explained why he behaved rudely with sita devi so i'll read out that portion of the ramayana the original verses lord ramachandra says avashyam trishu lokeshu na sita paapam arhati i know for certain that there is not a single blemish on sita i know lord mm. ramachandra is saying i know dirga kaloshita hiyam ravananta pure subha for a long time sita devi was in ravana's uh, under ravana in ravana shelter balisah kalu kamatma ramo dasharathatmajah iti vakshyanti mam santo janakim avishodya hi if i accepted you without uh, you are undergoing without your undertaking the test without your undertaking some form of te- uh, test what would people speak people would say that ramachandra he was so lusty 
that he didn't bother who his wife ran away with. He, when she came back, he took her. So, Lord Ramachandra said, therefore, I had to make you, uh, I had to speak like this so that you would demonstrate to the world your character. So, somebody may say, oh, Lama, Ramachandra is so selfish. He wanted to establish his, uh, he mm -hmm. wanted to save his reputation. Mm -hmm. Lord Ramachandra is not worried about his reputation. What happens is, suppose I blame you for something. I call you some bad words. I call you some ill names. What will happen? You will say, Pagal, kuch bol rahe, bolne do. <laughs> you will keep quiet and you will not bother. Suppose I call your mother ill names. Mm. Will you keep quiet? No. Thuran yeah. chapal hath mein hajayega. <laughs> Kyun? Yes. Why? Mm. Why? When I called you the ill name, you didn't bother. Mm. But when I called your mother the same ill name, mm. or maybe 50% of that, you cannot tolerate. Yes. So, the, the point is, when I love somebody very deeply, if somebody insults that person, that becomes unbearable. Mm. If somebody insults me, I can tolerate. If somebody I love is insulted, mm. that I cannot tolerate. So, if somebody were to insult Lord Rama like this, Lord Ramachandra would not be affected. Mm. He is beyond all this. Ramana also called Lord, uh, Lord Ramachandra so many things. Lord Rama is not bothered. But Sita Devi would not be able to tolerate. Mm. So, Lord Rama had to, from that perspective, Lord Ramachandra thought, if this kind of situation arises where people will blame me, then Sita Maya will not be able to tolerate. And not only that, Lord Ramachandra then says, uh, Ananya hrudayam bhaktam machitta parivartinim. That I know Sita, that you are Ananya bhakta. You are, you are, a, you are an unalloyed devotee of mine. You have, you, in your heart, you don't have anybody else. You cannot think of anyone else other than me. You are totally devoted to me. I know you. I know your heart. Lord Ramachandra said, Ahamappi avagachami maithilin janakatma jam. So I also know Maithili that your, your character is like this. You, you have such unalloyed, uh, firm love for me. You are, you are, you are my devotee. That, then Lord Ramachandra says, Pratyartham tu lokanam trayanam satya samshraya. The word uh, uh, pratyayartham, the word pratyaya has multiple meanings. In Sanskrit, every word will have multiple meanings. According to the context, mm. the meaning has to be understood. So here in this context, when Lord Ramachandra is saying, Lokanam Trayanam, Pratyaya Artham, he said, uh, at the same time, I wanted your fame to spread unlimitedly and uh, forever, eternally, your fame should be established in the three worlds. And therefore, I spoke like this. So Lama, Ramachandra had two things in mind. By speaking uh, strongly to Sita Devi, one is Sita Devi would undertake to prove herself, her own, uh, great character, which would prevent people from talking ill about Lord Ramachandra, which would save Sita Maya from that pain. And simultaneously, it would increase the glory of Sita Maya. And like I said earlier, the Lord is the most happy when his devotees are glorified, rather than himself being glorified. So, this is, and, and then further, what happened was, after this, Lord Shiva came before them. And he showed them, Dasharat Maharaj is with Indra and he has come to see you. Because after Dasharat Maharaj passed away, he went to Indra Loka. Then Dasharat Maharaj also came and all the Devatas came, he also came down. And he spoke to Lord Ramachandra and he spoke to Sita Devi. He said, oh Putri, oh my daughter, please don't get angry with Ramachandra. So he said, Kartavya, Kartavyo na to vaidehi manush, uh, uh, manyus tyagam imam prati. This is Dasharatha speaking. So this is Dasharatha speaking. He said, Oh, Vaidehi, please don't get angry with Lord Ramachandra. You already got angry. Please give up your anger towards him. Why? Ramena tvad vishuddhyartam krita metad hitaishina. Rama is hitaishina. He wanted your welfare. Therefore, he spoke like that. For what? Vishuddhyartam. Now, again, the word vishuddhyartam has to be understood in the context. Normally, when you say, when you say vishuddhyartam, somebody may say it is for your purification. purification yeah. But Lord Ramachandra already said... That she is already pure. Agnidev said, you are already pure. So it's already established she is pure. What, what purification mm. will, you, will you do for somebody who is already pure? Mm. So Vishuddhyartam, you have to understand in this context, that this is for establishing your purity. So that people understand that you are completely pure. Your character, your spotless character, people have to understand. To establish your spotless character, Hitaishinaha, Lord Ramachandra, wishing your welfare, he acted like this. 
कृतम यत्ते अन्य नारीणाम यशो ही अभिभविष्यति सो बाय डूइंग दिस व्हाट रामचंद्र हैज एस्टैब्लिश्ड अन्यो नारीणाम यशः नो अदर वुमन कैन बिकम एज ग्लोरियस एज यू सो दिस इज व्हाट लॉर्ड रामचंद्र अचीव्ड बाय दिस सो देयर आर मल्टीपल थिंग्स इन दिस whenever the lord does anything the lord achieves multiple things by this the lord sent back chaya sita he would not touch chaya sita, chaya sita. because lord ramachandra is ek patni vrata mm. for him only the original sita so he refused to even touch, touch. the mm. chaya sita who came mm. so she had to go into the agni original chaya sita has to come mm. so he could have declared to the world mm. this is chaya sita send her back bring yeah. original yeah. sita mm. then the original sita's glory mm. would not mm. have been established so he wanted to send back the chaya sita get back the original sita and also establish her glory in such a way that no other woman could compete with her in in character, character. in spotless character so all these things lord ramachandra established and uh, in fact interestingly what happens is when sita devi when lord ramachandra spoke to sita devi very harshly she asked the lord ramachandra one question which all of us should ask ourselves she asked oh lord ramachandra if you if if you wanted to reject me why did you have to undergo all this uh, war with uh, ramana when you sent hanuman you could have sent word with him that you have rejected me and i would have given up my life there and then no more wa- need of any war mm. you didn't have to take all this trouble after undergoing all the trouble crossing the ocean building a build of uh, building, building a bridge of stones fighting with ramana and his whole kumbhakarna and his whole army and taking so much risk after all that finally you you did all this to reject me that is the question she asked lord mm-hmm. ramachandra but lord ramachandra was silent mm-hmm. why because if he responded to that then the whole thing would be out <laughs> so he did not respond so to that that question. was revealed in the kurma purana no no this is in the ramayana uh, okay so we also had to ask ourselves if lord ramachandra wanted to insult sita devi and he had a mm-hmm. doubt on her character he didn't have to fight the battle with uh, mm-hmm. ramana he could have uh, sent a message with uh, hanuman uh, you know forget it i have i have rejected you mm-hmm. and uh, you stay with ramana some word he could have sent and she would have given up her life over mm-hmm. so the very fact that lord ramachandra did not give up mm-hmm. was because he knew the spotless character of mm-hmm. sita devi and to to avoid a situation where sita devi's heart would be distressed because somebody would put a mm-hmm. allegation on lord ramachandra that he was so mm-hmm. uh, uh, he was so lusty after sita that he didn't bother about whether she whether she was with another man or something like that to avoid the distressful condition to sita lord ramachandra uh, you know created that kind of situation and to glorify sita devi and to bring back the original sita so many things lord ramachandra achieved by this one act so first of all lord ramachandra did not choose that she has to undergo agni pariksha it was sita maiya's okay. choice number 2 the intent the purpose be, uh, the intent of uh, behind any activity is what really determines whether mm-hmm. the act is whether the act is uh, right or wrong mm-hmm. for example the act of killing mm-hmm. i may say killing is a wrong activity how can anybody kill anybody else right it is, if somebody if i if i were to kill someone here what will happen police will come the judiciary will pass a sentence they may even give me a death sentence not acceptable same person i if i go to the border and there is a war with a neighboring country with an enemy country and i kill not one person 20 people i kill what will happen i guess calendar award i will be awarded for that mm. the whole country will glorify me mm. newspapers will come and click photograph and say oh this man such a great hero mm. same i if i come and uh, 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 murder someone uh, next to my house what will happen good person i'll be made a, i will be made, made a villain so the intent behind that activity is what determines whether that activity is good or bad the intent of lord ramachandra in his act was not to to establish his superiority over sita devi or to to satisfy himself that sita devi is pure that was not his intention if he if that was his intention then we could have questioned him that was not lord ramachandra's intention lord ramachandra's intention was in the future if somebody were to were to ali were to put any allegation against me sita devi will be destroyed let that not happen to her that was number 1 number 2 sita devi should be so much glorified that no other woman should be able to compete with her that was lord ramachandra's intent 
So if you look at all these things and Lord Ramachandra want to give up the Chaya Sita and get back the original Sita. So all his intentions, in all these intentions of Lord Ramachandra, he was never in the center. He had no personal consideration. All his thoughts were for the welfare of Sita Devi. That's why Dasharat Maharaj said, Hitai Shinaha. He is thought only of your welfare. He has not thought about himself. So therefore, you cannot put any blame on Lord Ramachandra. Now coming back to how the, 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 I told you about the, the Kurma Purana telling about Chaya Sita and original Sita. Now Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he actually explains the inner meaning of that. Mm-hmm. Why that Chaya Sita and had to, be, uh, uh, had to be put in place of the original Sita. And what is the meaning of this that uh, Agni Dev took her away mm-hmm. and then brought her back and all those things. Reality is, Lord Krishna tells in the Bhagavad Gita that uh, uh, Bhumi Rapo Anolo Vayu Kham Mano Buddhi Revacha Ahankara Itiyamme Bhinna Prakritir Ashtada. This material world comprising of earth, water, fire, air, space, mind, intelligence, ego, all these eight elements constitute his external energy, which is Bahiranga Shakti, external energy, which is called an inferior energy. Apareyam itas tvanyam prakriti vidhim me param, jiva bhutam yaya idam dharyate jagat. So, there is another prakriti, another energy of Krishna, which is superior energy, which is his uh, uh, which is this internal energy, which are the living entities. So the living entity, the spirit soul, is a higher superior energy compared to dead matter. Why? Because living entities have consciousness, dead matter does not have consciousness. This is the main difference. Now, our body, the body that we possess, the body that we are occupying, is made of these eight elements. Mm. Earth, water, fire, air, space, mind, intelligence, ego. Gross body, subtle body, combination of this becomes the residence for me as a spirit soul. Now, what happens is, we all, when we reside in this body, our, the, the, the way we perceive this material world is through this gross body. I have to use my eyes to see form. I have to use my ears to hear sound. I have to use my nose to, 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 to smell something. I have to use my tongue to taste something. I have to use my skin to touch something. So these are my five Gyanendriyas. And these five Gyanendriyas form, taste, sound, smell, touch. These five things are what these senses can absorb. They can perceive. Whatever I see in this material world, it has to be within, it has to be, uh, uh, it has to be reduced to one of these five things one or more of these five things for me, be, for me to be able to perceive it. If, 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 it, if it is not within the purview of these five things, I cannot perceive it. For example, let us say there is one copper wire lying here. The, let us say there are two copper wires lying here. Okay. Now one of them is connected to the switch and the switch is switched on and it is charged. The other wire is simply lying idle. Now, when you form, when you look at the form of the two wires, can you make out which one has electricity, which one doesn't have electricity? Not possible. You cannot. Because, why? Because electricity does, it does not have form, it does not have taste, it does not have touch, it does not have smell. None of these things mm. are there in it. Right? Mm. So, now, now, if I go and touch that dead wire, I will not feel anything. Yes. Now, you go and touch that live wire. I know electricity is there. I would not recommend anybody to do it. <laughs> but that's the way. Otherwise, I have to put a bulb. And when the bulb glows, in one wire the bulb will not glow. In the other, the bulb glows. I can go, oh yes, there is electricity. That is a safer way of doing it. So either I have to reduce that electricity to my touch or to a form which I can see in the form of the bulb glowing. So anything in this material world, unless I reduce it to one of these five elements, I cannot perceive it. And there are many things like electromagnetic radiation, which I cannot perceive with any of these things. Only when its symptoms are manifested in terms of one of these five uh, uh, objects, then only I can perceive that, oh, something called electromagnetic radiation exists. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I, mm-hmm. I, 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 cannot, I cannot touch, I cannot see, I cannot perceive electromagnetic radiation or ultraviolet rays. There's so many things are there like this. So the spirit soul, the atma that is there and consciousness that is there, 
is similarly beyond the purview of these five objects. So there is no way I can perceive. There is no way I can perceive the spirit soul. But I can perceive the spirit soul by its absence. Suppose I am right now sitting here speaking, you are able to hear me, all these things are going on. And one fine day I will die. When I die, the form that you are seeing, which you are assuming is me, will still be there. The body is still there. But what will you say? Oh, Prabhu left. What to do? He has gone. He left all of us. Where did I go? Body is still there. The same eyes, nose, ears, hands, legs, everything is there. That means you are not able to see the person within the body. You are seeing this body, but you are not seeing me who am within this body. Why? Because the spirit soul is made of the higher energy. Apariyam vithas tu anyam prakritim vidhi. So the superior energy cannot be perceived by the lower energy. All the senses that I have now, my eyes, ears, nose, etc., they are made of the lower energy. So I cannot see, perceive the spirit soul. So the, the internal energy of the Lord cannot be perceived by the external energy. But when I am talking, when I am saying something, you are able to hear and perceive my presence. That is because that sound is generated by the spirit soul. So my speaking is a symptom of my existence. And when I die, the body, the tongue, everything will be there. Throat, everything will be there. But I will not be able, the body will not speak. So by that symptom, you can understand the person is not there. Yeah. So to, to perceive yourself, to be able to see yourself, that is not possible in this world. Mm -hmm. You can look at yourself in the mirror mm -hmm. and you can see the body, but that's not you. So in fact, your whole life, you would not have seen, seen yourself. yourself. When you are a small <laughs> child, you look at yourself in the body, in the, in the mirror, you would have th thought, I'm a small boy, I'm a small whole boy. Whole life, I've not seen myself. Huh. So as long as you are in that small child's body, you are thinking as you are a small mm -hmm. boy. Then you become, at one point of time, you become an adolescent, a teenager. Then you used to look at yourself, you know, all your hairstyle and all that and shirt and pant and latest fashion and all that. You used to think you are like that. Then you become a middle-aged person, you start thinking you are a middle-aged person. So are you the child? Are you the young guy? Are you, are you the middle-aged person? Are you the old man? What are you? <laughs> Different times, you know, my body changes, I identify myself, myself with that. So factually, I have not been able to see myself. Forget about seeing others. I am only seeing the external body, which is anyway something which will I leave and go one day. So, the point is that the superior energy cannot be perceived by the inferior energy. Either by touch, by sound, by, by form, by taste, by smell, it cannot be perceived in any way. This is the reality. Now, now what happens is Sita Maya is completely the internal energy of Lord Ramachandra. And what is Ramana? Ramana is a person who is completely in the bodily concept of life, absorbed in thinking I am part of the, I am the lower, uh, lower external energy of the Lord. I am the inferior energy of the Lord. So such a person who is completely dependent upon the inferior energy for his perception okay. of the outside world, he cannot perceive, he cannot even see Sita Maya. Okay, okay. Not possible, mm -hmm. unless she wills it. Mm -hmm. So it is not possible for Ravana to abduct Sita Maya, to touch her, to see her, it's not possible. I was wondering why he was telling the soul and Atma concept. Now I understood. Uh, yeah, that's the reality. Uh -huh. Therefore, the original Sita Maya had to be replaced with a Chaya Sita whom Ravana could see, touch and abduct. Uh -huh. <laughs> Insider information. So this is the this is the confidential understanding of the pastime of uh -huh. Sita Maya being abducted by uh, uh, Ravana and how the whole Agni Pariksha happened. So you see, it, is, it, it has got a very profound meaning to the whole incident. You cannot trivialize it by comparing it with ordinary mortals. How we would behave with one another. You cannot do that. Over and above that, you have to understand one more thing. Lord Ramachandra is the Supreme Personality of God. His act of crossing the ocean by building a bridge of floating stones. Can anybody imitate it? Never. Not possible. Not possible. The Lord Ramachandra, he attacked the Lanka, which was most, which had the most advanced military strength at that point of time. Ravana's army was very formidable. It was, the, the, even the Devatas could not defeat him. With all the power that the Devatas had, they, were, they, were, they could never stand in front of the army of Ravana. And Ravana's army was equipped not only with the latest uh, 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 weapons, he had such great commanders in his army. His own son, 
Kumbhakarna mm. and uh, so many others. They were all such powerful warriors. Who, what did Lord Ramachandra have on his, head, on his side? He, Lakshmana, two mm. brothers, rest were all monkeys. monkeys. And when the war started between Ravana and between uh, the Vanara army, Vanara Saini of Lord Ramachandra, Ravana's army, they are releasing arrows, trishulas, and all kinds of uh, celestial weapons. They are throwing all modern things, you know, at the, at the army of the monkeys. What are the monkeys doing? They are catching some uh, uh, branch of some tree, uh, taking some stone. Nothing is available, jumping on the warrior and uh, scratching with their nails. This is what they were doing. So there was nothing more that the monkeys could do. That's all that they could do. That's all that they knew. They did not know how to release arrows and use uh, clubs and all those things, except for maybe a few people, like maybe Hanuman and other people. But otherwise, vast majority of them, they had no knowledge of all these weapons. Your Lord but, required monkeys to rescue his wife. But, still, but still, <laughs> at the end of the war, not a single monkey on the side of Ramachandra died, whereas the entire dynasty, entire army of Ramana was wiped out. So, Again, is this something which is imitable? Nobody can imitate this. We can understand from this that Lord Ramachandra performed feats which is impossible for anyone to uh, imitate. They are superhuman activities. Similarly, Sita Maya entering the Agni and coming out is also a superhuman activity. It's not something which is to be imitated by a common man. So we have to understand it in that angle. The Lord, when he performs activities, if he acts exactly like an ordinary human being, if he were to take a ship and cross the ocean and go and all those kind of things, then we cannot recognize him to be the Supreme Lord. Similarly, Sita Maya is the internal uh, energy of the Supreme Lord and she is his eternal consort. Similarly, she will also perform activities which uh, superhuman activities which uh, no human can uh, ever imitate. And uh, uh, what Sita Maya did, has anybody else done the same thing? Never. Not possible for anybody else to perform. So we can understand the position of Sita Maya. How she is the Jaganmata, she is the eternal consort of the Lord. She is not an ordinary living entity like an ordinary woman in this mm -hmm. material world. So we cannot judge Lord Ramachandra saying, how can stones float on the water? Mm -hmm. If you use your mundane logic and uh, knowledge of science to try to uh, judge Lord Ramachandra's activities, you cannot do it. Similarly, you cannot use mundane logic to analyze Sita Maya's going into the Agni Pariksha and coming out. It's, it's not a mundane activity. It's a transcendental pastime of the Supreme Lord. So therefore, if you try to analyze how, why uh, Lord Ramachandra did it, he was a male sovereign, all these kind of things, you're using mundane logic on something which is a superhuman activity, which you can never be able to analyze and assess on material principles. So therefore, the entire incident of uh, Sita Maya undertaking that Agni Pariksha is something which we have to see from a different light altogether from the position of Lord Ramachandra being the Supreme Personality of Godhead and Sita Maya being the Supreme Energy of the Supreme Lord, the in internal, eternal energy of the Supreme Lord. So, when we understand from that perspective, only then we can understand all this. Otherwise, it's just a mundane logic and reasoning. With mundane reasoning and logic, if you try to analyze, you will not be able to understand. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. <laughs> okay. Next week, the, uh, Ramana has one character, the brother of uh, Ravana, Vibhishana. Vibhishana. No, generally in North India, they say uh, Garki, Danka, say which uh, Danka, 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 Lanka Dai. Garka Bedi Lanka Dai. So, how do you see that character? If you would have been a brother, you would have supported like Kumbhakarna, your brother, but he supported the uh, opposition. Opposition. Party. Yeah. True. What we have to understand is we have uh, two contrasting uh, examples. Mm -hmm. One is Vibhishana, who forsake his brother and came to the side of Lord Ramachandra. Mm -hmm. And if you look on the side of the uh, Lord Krishna in his past times in the Mahabharata, Bhishma, who stood with Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana, mm. despite knowing mm. who is right. Mm. So, actually what we have to understand is, when it comes to the following the principles of Dharma, when it, follow, when it comes to performing one's duty, there are different uh, levels of duties to be performed. 
some are uh, lesser duties some are superior duties when you are faced with a conflict whether to perform one duty or the other when they both seem to be in opposition to each other you have to weigh which is a superior dharma and which is a lower dharma which is the superior duty which is a lower duty mm. just like they say for the sake of a village mm. a family can be sacrificed mm. for the sake of a city a village can be sacrificed mm. for the sake of the country one city can be sacrificed mm. so what does that mean mm. that means the principle is we should try to protect everyone nobody should uh, die mm. but if it comes to choosing between the the country and the city you have to choose the country mm. that's a, you know that's a natural thing i am giving a crude example mm. to understand duties in this material world they they have they are of different hierarchy they are of different levels some are superior some are lower whenever there is a clash between two duties you have to choose the one which is higher now the highest duty in this world lord krishna after instructing the entire bhagavad gita to arjuna at the end of the 18th chapter he told arjuna now i told you so many things i have told you karma yoga i told you jnana yoga i have told you uh, the, this one ashtanga yoga i have told you sankhya yoga so many things i told you mm-hmm. isn't it then lord krishna says now forget all of them <laughs> shrinu me paramam vachah listen to my ultimate final instruction what you have to do i have told you so many things now i am telling you what you have to do this is the ultimate thing rest everything else is secondary mm-hmm. what is that krishna says sarva dharman parityajya give up all this dharma all other duties maam ekam saranam raja you surrender only unto me don't surrender to anybody else surrender only unto me so somebody may say if i give up all my duty and surrender only to krishna what happens to all those duties i will incur a severe sinful reaction for neglecting my other duties duties there are duties towards my parents there are duties towards my country there are duties towards devatas towards the rishis towards other living entities towards my relatives towards my family so many duties are there to perform so if i give up all of them and surrender only to krishna what will happen to me krishna says ma chuchah don't worry about other things aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokshayami i am relieving you if you are surrendering unto me fully now i am relieving you of the Uh, of the of your obligation to perform all other duties you will not be affected so vibhishana uh, what did vibhishana do vibhishana followed this principle he decided to surrender fully to lord ramachandra keeping aside all other duties his duties towards his country towards his brother gave up all that and said the supreme lord ramachandra has come all these duties are secondary highest duties to surrender to him and therefore Vibhishana went and surrendered to him. What the case in regard to Bhishma? He didn't apply this dharma. Bhishma's case is different. I'll come to that. Mm. Now, when you have brought up this question of Vibhishana, another interesting aspect Bhishma. I want to tell you. When Vibhishana came and came to Lord Ramachandra and wanting to surrender to him, at that time all the Sugriva and all other Vanaras got together mm. and told Lord Ramachandra, please don't accept him, Vibhishana. After all, he is an asura. We don't know what he is going to do. whether he will uh, uh, whether he will uh, uh, he may be a traitor he may come to spy upon us it could be anything he may he may he may have come for a uh, different uh, motive so don't accept him at that time lord ramachandra told one thing to all of them he said that uh, sakrudeva prapanno yes tavasmi iti yachate so if somebody comes and tells me even once that oh my lord i am yours then lord then uh, then uh, lord ramachandra says etad vratam mama this is my vow abhayam sada dasyami i will forever eternally protect him even if once somebody comes to lord ramachandra and tells him oh my lord i am yours and later he forgets lord ramachandra says i will not forget eternally i will protect him so therefore vibhishana has come to me now saying he is mine i cannot reject him even if ravana comes to me now and tells surrenders to me saying he is mine i will give him also eternal protection so this lord ramachandra told so this is the vrata of the lord anybody surrenders to the lord the lord will give him protection throughout eternally so imagine lord ramachandra told sita maiya you are my ananya bhakta he knows she is fully surrender unto him will he ever give her up will he subject her to agni pariksha he will never do it for testing her it is for the outside world to establish her name it is for her own good that lord ramachandra did that
if by following the ramayana's principles of re relationship with their brother husband wife mother father it's applicable for the common populace the how how they have to lead their lives or is it that a transcendent and plain oh it's for the lord this is how they behave what's what's in for me how should i conduct my life is it also for the common masses well it is like this uh, like i said the lord when he comes he teaches multiple lessons mm -hmm. on a mundane platform we can say that uh, bharata behaved like an ideal brother this is how we should also be sita devi was an ideal chaste uh, 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 a wife uh, lord ramachandra behaved as an ideal son all these things we may say but actually if you see the real lesson that lord ramachandra wants us to learn what is that for the sake of the supreme lord krishna or the supreme lord ramachandra one must be ready to reject one's mother mm. bharata did that mm. one must be ready to reject uh, one's uh, you know all the opulences that you you, you may be a princess mm. you may be you have a big palace you may be the daughter of a big king but for the sake of the lord you should be ready to give up everything and go to the forest so the, the, you know these are the the examples which are set by the personalities whether it is by hanuman or by vibhishna vibhishna mm. was ready to give up his own brother and his own kingdom for the sake of the supreme lord so the what we are getting is the real essence of the ramayana is sarva dharman parityajya maam ekam sharanam raja aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokshishyami maashitah if you really want to understand the ramayana this is the lesson lord ramachandra wants you to learn <laughs> <laughs> okay so ramayana to ho gaya pro any other controversial thing which comes into existence is in mahabharata hmm. where uh, even now there are movies and serials made again and again on how karna was put into difficulty he was unnecessarily you know put into those challenges he doesn't deserve that what he went through so it is seen in a, uh, another sense to yeah it all begins with uh, saying that uh, 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 draupadi in that swayamvara she said uh, she insulted karna saying mm -hmm. i will not marry a shudra mm -hmm. actually what did uh, draupadi say mm -hmm. draupadi said naham varayami sutam mm -hmm. the word suta does not mean shudra okay so what happens is suta, suta refers to doesn't refer shudra no suta refers to charioteer charioteers are those people in those times mm -hmm. who used to be of mixed varna mm -hmm. if a kshatriya mm -hmm. is of a mixed varna he becomes a charioteer mm -hmm. not a shudra mm -hmm. shudra will make the he will be a carpenter he will mm -hmm. make the chariot wheel everything mm -hmm. but he will not have the guts to go into the battlefield and mm -hmm. ride the, because when you go into the battlefield kshatriya means what mm -hmm. kshatriya means a person who has a spirit mm -hmm. that even at the cost of my life i will protect those who have taken shelter of me mm -hmm. that is the spirit of a kshatriya that's what is mm -hmm. a real kshatriya mm -hmm. not that simply you take birth in a kshatriya family you become a kshatriya or a brahmana yes. that's not the the real spirit of kshatriya is no matter even at the risk he will not bother about his life mm. i am ready to put my life at risk but somebody has come and took shelter of me i'll give him protection mm. that's the mood of a kshatriya. kshatriya now when a kshatriya goes on to the battlefield the he is on the chariot actually even before him the chariot is, is, is charioteer is the person who is in the front first then first. comes the warrior mm, he is the guy who is exposed mm, most mm, mm. now he, he cannot be somebody who is a, who is a coward mm. he also has to, has to have that kshatriya spirit mm. that only he can be a chariot here mm. otherwise he will the moment the first arrow is released he will get down and run away so the first person who gets killed is the chariot here mm. then only the warrior comes in mm. so the chariot here also has to be somebody from a kshatriya spirit mm. so normally what used to happen was the chariot is would be kshatriyas of mixed varna not pure kshatriyas mm. but because pure kshatriyas would have the ability to mm. um, uh, throw arrows and uh, fight with uh, different weapons at a greater uh, skill mm. level the uh, people who are born of mixed varna they would not have that kind of skill levels so they would become charioteers mm. still that kshatriya spirit is there based on quality not by birth quality oh, quality yes. so because if you see although karna was known as a kshatriya mm. and known as a suta mm. suta putra radheya mm. he was the son of radha so although he was a suta putra still because he had that skill he was elevated to a warrior mm. but fact is if you see although karna was he had some skills but really he was lacking in kshatriya spirit mm -hmm. why because krishna tells in the bhagavad gita the real quality of a kshatriya is yuddhe chapalayanam mm -hmm. 
in a war in a battle he will never run away he will lay down his life he will not run away karna ran away from the battle karna ran away from the battle twice karna ran away from the battlefield twice 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 before the kurukshetra yuddha mm -hmm. i am not talking of the kurukshetra mm -hmm. yuddha twice mm -hmm. once when uh, uh, when uh, the pandavas were in the forest in exile duryodhana came to the forest i think the pandavas were in kamyavana he came to the forest to show off his opulence mm -hmm. see i am enjoying like this all the pandavas are wearing tree skin bark and all mm -hmm. those kind of things they are really uh, suffering i want to show off mm -hmm. so he brought his whole retinue and put a camp in the kamyavana very close to the where the pandavas were uh, staying and he wanted to go next day and in front of them have a whole party mm -hmm. and uh, show off and uh, enjoy that sadistic pleasure with that intention he came duryodhana came to the forest and it had become night so he put camp there and within karna was also there dushyasana all these people were there now what happened one uh, gandharva who was a friend of the of the of the uh, pandavas wa was instructed by indra mm. indra came to know duryodhana is mm. planning like this so he told the gandharva see if duryodhana has got this nefarious plan mm. you have to go and you have to file it so next day what happened when the duryodhana got up this gandharvas came attacked the camp mm. and when they attacked the camp their intention was to take duryodhana mm. because he was the problem creator so when they attacked all the kaurava army whatever small portion of the army duryodhana had brought with him including dushyasana karna they all started fighting and duryodhana himself fought but the gandharvas are too powerful mm. so at one point of time dushyasana ran away mm. karna also ran away duryodhana did, did not run away so he got captured mm -hmm. and then the some of the soldiers they went to the pandavas and told uh, see duryodhana has been captured please yes, help us yes. save our master mm -hmm. there is nobody because <laughs> karna also ran away dushasana ran away nobody can now protect duryodhana it's only the pandavas mm -hmm. then uh, yudhishthira told it's a matter of our uh, prestige of our dynasty mm -hmm. so he told arjuna and bhima mm -hmm. that you go and uh, rescue him that is how arjuna and bhima came and they fought with the gandharvas and they freed mm -hmm. duryodhana so at that time karna ran away mm -hmm. he should not have run away he should have been ready to wait there till the end of his uh, mm -hmm. till he till the last breath he should have stood there no he ran away that means arjuna is actually more powerful and chivalrous and has much more kshatriya spirit than by the, far by far karna was uh, karna was very prone to boasting mm -hmm. he would boast i am more capable than arjuna this that and all that mm -hmm. but uh, although he boasted so much he was not really that powerful mm -hmm. because the second instance when arjuna as brahmanala mm -hmm. with uttara that mm -hmm. uh, son of uh, virata maharaj he uh, uh, fought with the pandavas at that time bhishma was there uh, drona was there ashwatthama was there uh, karna was there duryodhana was there dushyasana was there everybody was there they all fought with arjuna all alone mm -hmm. and at that time even krishna was not there as the charioteer of uh, arjuna mm -hmm. arjuna defeated all of them and karna ran away mm -hmm. he, this was the second instance <laughs> so during the, the uh, when the battle of kurukshetra started uh, karna started boasting i will finish off the pandava arjuna is nothing in front of me at that time bhishma remained uh, are what are you talking <laughs> karna you have forgotten virata what happened in virata's kingdom mm. you know, all of us were there together mm. arjuna was all alone no mm. army no krishna nothing was there mm. and what did you do you ran away so then uh, Ar uh, karna became very uh, sometimes all these kind of things happen you you should not uh, insult me <laughs> that was karna's response so in reality he was not all that powerful so arjuna all alone defeated all of them then bhishma told see that time in virata's kingdom arjuna was all alone and uh, uttara the son of uh, virata he was not a very expert or something now kurukshetra krishna is the charioteer of arjuna where is the question arjuna alone is enough for all of us combined so now krishna also is sitting on the chariot where is the question duryodhana winning so bhishma was very clear bhishma and drona also told him many times hey, you are not going to win but duryodhana no 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 karna is on my side because <laughs> duryodhana brainless fellow he was he got carried away by karna's boasting simply by his boasting he thought you know karna is very powerful so this was not the reality in fact even during the battle of kurukshetra mm. one point of time bhima and karna came face to face mm. there was a pitched battle mm -hmm. bhima defeated karna bhima defeated karna bhima defeated karna bhima defeated karna why this and then shown... bhima did not uh, kill uh, karna he said i am not killing you because my brother arjuna has taken a vow to kill you therefore i am letting you go go chhod diya of course later another uh, yeah. battle happened between karna and bhima and karna defeated bhima also once mm -hmm. 
but then by then uh, karna had given a vow to kunti not to kill any of uh, his son so he let him go so so that way even bhima could defeat uh, karna so karna was not all, and bhima compared to arjuna he was not all that uh, what do you say expert in uh, archery but still he was able to defeat uh, karna so that way if you see and you also have to understand the character of uh, karna why uh, draupadi uh, uh, said that naham avarayami sutam i don't want to marry a charioteer why she said that mm-hmm. she said that because she knew the character of karna mm-hmm. that he was not of a noble character mm-hmm. and already draupadi had heard so much about arjuna her heart was given to arjuna so she could not marry anybody mm-hmm. else she knew that there is a risk that if karna uh, uh, participates he may win mm-hmm. there is no guarantee mm-hmm. arjuna is there he will definitely win mm-hmm. but karna she did not want to take a chance mm-hmm. and his character is also not good and anyway she wanted arjuna so she told she wanted to think of some excuse how to prevent him from participating mm-hmm. what to do now the only thing she could think of was he is a charioteer i am a king's daughter it is like saying i am the daughter of the ceo of this company i don't want to mar- marry some pun in the company you mm-hmm. bring another ceo as the alliance for me mm-hmm. i will think similar way she said i don't want to marry some charioteer so that's the only thing she could think of at the moment mm-hmm. somehow she had to think of some excuse so she said i don't want to marry a charioteer go away and in a swayamvara because it is draupadi swayamvara uh, the girl's wish is foremost that is mm-hmm. so the moment she has expressed this wish mm-hmm. nobody can go against it so here also the woman's wish is important no yes yes <laughs> now, now if you say karna has to fight then you are being male chauvinistic so her desire she expressed everybody had to follow that yes so so we have to under, and and karna's real character was demonstrated in that assembly mm-hmm. when the pandavas lost the game of mm-hmm. dice when the pandavas lost the game of dice duryodhana actually he his intention was to get indraprastha he had become enamored by indraprastha he wanted to get indraprastha so what he did he played the game of dice and got the kingdom now karna was not satisfied with it mm-hmm. he needled duryodhana mm-hmm. hey draupadi call 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 draupadi mm-hmm. let us get her it was karna's uh, this one okay. it was karna's needling it was his idea mm. to bring draupadi and to disrobe her in the assembly mm. now kshatriya means what kshatta trayate iti kshatriya mm. the one who protects you from any kind of harm mm. is called a kshatriya harm means not only physical harm even harm to one's honor mm. honor is considered more important than the body in the mm. vedic system mm. kshatriya's duty is to protect the honor of his citizens mm. now if you look at the the assembly of the kauravas the, the in that assembly of the game of dice what had happened was the the pandavas had told if we lose the game of dice we will become your servants they lost the game of dice now they have become servants of the kauravas servants of duryodhana now it is the duty of a kshatriya to protect everybody who is under his shelter mm. therefore it was the duty of duryodhana to protect the pandavas who had become his servants and therefore he had to protect them physically as well as their honor mm-hmm. he should have thought how to protect the honor of my people instead what did he do he thought let me uh, see how to remove the honor of these people so he was not acting as a kshatriya and karna well, he is even worse than duryodhana duryodhana thought let me insult the pandavas karna is thinking how to insult a woman mm-hmm. insulting a woman is never acceptable in the vedic uh, varnashrama system the whole actually if you see the whole battle of kurukshetra happened why because Dra- draupadi's honor was insulted mm-hmm. the whole battle between ravana and lord rama happened why because sita maya's honor was insulted we were real feminist in that sense definitely because according to the today the other day i was uh, reading some uh, uh, guy got uh, convicted in a rape case in india mm. and he has got some 7 years jail or 14 years jail or something like that in the vedic times if a man abducts a woman who is already married to somebody else then that man should be given the death sentence doesn't have to wait for the court king and all that mm. the husband of the woman simply because he abducted her can go and kill her open license mm. that is why lord ramachandra went and killed uh, uh, ravana because it is sanctioned in the scripture atatayana atatayana 
that much honor was given to uh, give uh, that much you know the honor of a woman was so highly I, respected yeah. in the vedic society if a man abducts a woman also if he abducts an unmarried girl then the girl then he has to marry her and give her the position of his wife and as a, a mistress of the house mm -hmm. if he doesn't do that again he can be killed two greatest wars were fought because the honor of a woman was insulted mm -hmm. so this is you know unfortunately over a period of time our culture it got corrupted it, it got degraded so women started becoming oppressed and all these kind of things all these same practices became oppressive practices originally mm -hmm. it was something else mm -hmm. Yeah, there are many instances in the mahabharata ramayana where you can see all these things so the the the, the you know the, the that way if you see karna he should have protected the honor of draupadi what did he do he was the one who thought how to destroy the honor of draupadi so what kind of kshatriya is he the moment he did that he has fallen from the position of a kshatriya because kshatriya is kshatta trayati iti kshatriya only when he protects the honor and the life of his praja only then he can be called a kshatriya how come his spiritual master is uh, uh, parashuram parashuram he is such a exalted he is a spiritual master of dronacharya and also uh, bhishma how come such disciple of such a great guru becomes uh, like that, that he became a disciple of uh, parashuram also by deceit only no huh. he did not reveal who he was uh. and because of that only he got cursed by parashuram that you will forget this knowledge whenever you need it the most so there also we can see karna is all doing everything deceit cheating and uh, uh, trying to destroy the honor of his he, is, he never acted like a kshatriya but on the battlefield when arjuna was about to kill him so then in his chariot wheel was stuck hmm. so that was injustice right and you know, how how do you justify that time that? karna said the same thing uh. arjuna how can you do this injustice hmm. at that time krishna replied hmm. arjuna did not reply krishna replied you know what krishna replied he said uh, you are talking of injustice when did you talk about injustice when draupadi's uh, uh, robes were getting uh, removed mm. in that assembly mm. so you have no right to talk about justice or injustice mm. you did that so you deserve to death, uh, to die like this only you don't deserve a just that you have to deserve by injustice only mm. this is what you deserve mm. this was krishna's response mm. because you have to understand krishna for krishna you know there is an instance here to uh, why krishna you know had so much anger mm. the god bhagwan means he should be very merciful, merciful. he should forgive. forgive why is he showing so much anger towards you know so much vengeful krishna is why mm. because we have to understand krishna's nature his character mm. you see what happened was when uh, the four kumaras the four sons of uh, brahma they were all like small kids they went to vaikuntha with a desire to have darshan of narayana's lotus feet when they came to the gate jay and vijaya stopped them and when they stopped them they were very upset you are preventing us from rendering devotional service to narayana therefore you fall down to the material world they cursed jay and vijaya like this immediately after cursing them the four kumaras felt very bad no why, why why did we do like this jay and vijaya after all they were doing their duty they were also serving narayana only we should not have done this so they were feeling remorse in their heart by then the news of the commotion had reached narayana's ears narayana personally came walking to the mm. gate the supreme lord mm. he came to the gate of vaikuntha and he spoke to the four kumaras and he told them whatever you have done is absolutely right i agree with you mm. so the kumaras were a little bit confused is the lord being sarcastic <laughs> or does he really mean what he is saying and if he really means what he is saying how how is it justified that we curse them so then to to clarify lord narayana speaks he speaks us a few wonderful verses he speaks about how much he loves his devotees mm. and then he gives an example he see, he says you are my devotees and the extent of my love to you he says narayana says chindyam swabahu api vah pratikula vrittim he says narayana says if my arm were to rise against you i will not hesitate to chop it off mm. this is the love of lord narayana you know when we love someone we tell अगर किसी ने तुमको हाथ लगाए तो हाथ तोड़ देंगे उसका बट हमारा हाथ लग गया तो चलेगा चलेगा वो कोई आप कोई तोड़ने के बाद नहीं करेगा दैट मच लव वी डोंट हैव फॉर अनदर पर्सन नारायण इज लव इज सो मच ही सेइंग नॉट इवन अदर सिर्फ माय ओन हैंड वर टू राइज अगेंस्ट यू आई विल चॉप इट ऑफ आई विल नॉट अलाउ इट टू टच यू 
This is the love Narayana has for his devotees. This is the love Krishna has for Draupadi. Because Draupadi is, uh, is this Ananya Bhakt, uh, 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 you know, she is she's his pure devotee. Mm. So Krishna cannot tolerate. Naturally, his anger comes. Mm. But Krishna's anger is not like our anger. Mm. When Krishna becomes angry, he chastises someone. That person becomes purified of the sinful activity he has done and he gets liberated. You mean to say Karana also got liberated or got purified? Karana got purified because of that. After, after he died, Karana went to Swargaloka. He didn't go to Naraka. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he should have, for the all those sinful activities he did, he should have gone to the netherworlds. Mm -hmm. But then, because he saw the Lord, he, he, he the Lord purified him and he died at the hands of Arjuna, a pure devotee. Naturally, he had to get purified of his uh, all his contaminations. Mm -hmm. So that is that is so that's the reason why. So when we look at from all these angles, uh, the Lord did the right thing with uh, Karna. He did not. He was not unjust to him. Mm -hmm. Externally, when we look at it, it may appear like that. But when we understand Krishna's mood, then we can see that uh, what uh, Karna underwent. It was good for him only. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, he got uh, purified of his uh, all his contamination. Another great controversy which erupts from Mahabharata in the similar lines because mm -hmm. of casteism or the current scenarios is Ekalavya. Ekalavya, yes. Ekalavya was also unnecessary, you know, a tribal, punishment, tribal, a tribal oppressed by a Brahmana. By a Brahmana. <laughs> so this narrative is, or this propaganda has been running <laughs> since the true, 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 true. Actually, if you want to understand that instance of Ekalavya, you have to first understand the character of Dronacharya. Mm -hmm. Now, Dronacharya had a, a tiff with, uh, uh, with uh, the king of, uh, 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 with uh, Drupada Maharaj. And uh, because of that uh, misunderstanding, they had some quarrel between them. Uh, and uh, uh, when uh, the Pandavas uh, had uh, completed their education, they wanted to, uh, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, when they asked the Dronacharya what Guru Dakshina you want, he said, go and uh, capture Drupada and bring him alive to me. The Kauravas tried Duryodhana, they were all defeated. Drupada defeated. was also powerful. He defeated all of them. Then Arjuna went all alone and he captured Drupada and brought him. And then uh, the, the Dronacharya spoke to Drupada because Drupada had insulted Dronacharya earlier. So he told him, see, you insulted me. That's why now you are in this position. So I, after all, I, previously they were friends. So I did not want to harm you in any way. So I'm releasing you. You go back. I wanted you to learn a lesson not to insult people like this. Mm -hmm. Dronacharya was, he handled it nicely. Drupada went back mm -hmm. and Drupada was impressed by the fighting skills of Arjuna mm -hmm. and he thought Arjuna was really powerful. Although he was uh, defeated and captured by Arjuna, he was impressed by him mm -hmm. and he thought I should, uh, you know, he should become my son-in-law. Mm -hmm. And that is how mm -hmm. later he married uh, uh, Draupadi also. Now, when, uh, he, when Drupada went back, although he was impressed by Arjuna and the thought of uh, handing over Draupadi to Arjuna, uh, he, uh, Drupada could not digest the uh, insult he had to undergo at the hands of Dronacharya. So what he thought, I should do something to avenge my insult. He thought, I am too powerless to fight against Dronacharya. And uh, none of my relatives are that capable. So let me do a yajna and beget a son who can kill Dronacharya. Mm -hmm. And so he conducted a yajna for this specific purpose. This was in a place called Kampilya, even today. If you go to Uttar Pradesh, there is a place called Farukabad. Near there, there is the place called Kampilya. And even today, the place where that havan happened, mm -hmm. from which Drishtadyumna and Draupadi came out, they mm -hmm. were born from the fire. Mm -hmm. So that place is a nice sarovar there. Mm -hmm. And so that is the place where this happened. So now, Drishtadyumna was born from the fire with the uh, uh, purpose, specific purpose of killing Dronacharya. Mm -hmm. That was how he was begotten. This was known to everyone. Dronacharya had also heard about it. When Drishtadyumna grew up and when the time came for him to go and learn the art of warfare, Drupada considered that the best teacher in the whole world is Dronacharya. <laughs> he told his son, you go to Dronacharya and you learn the art of warfare from him. There cannot be a better teacher. Drishtadyumna came to Dronacharya. And in Vedic tradition, the younger person being a subordinate, he has to introduce himself first. Mm -hmm. Drishtadyumna introduced himself to Dronacharya. I am Drishtadyumna, mm -hmm. son of Drupada, mm -hmm. born to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Dronacharya asked him, yes, tell me, my dear son, what do you want from me? He said, I want you to teach me the art of warfare. This is Brahmana. He accepted. 
I'll come to that. Oh. Now, you, you, you tell me, somebody comes to you, tells you, I'm born to kill you, and I want to learn how to kill you from you. <laughs> what will you do? Sir, where is that sword? Finish this fellow so that, like, like Kamsa, Kamsa. Like Kamsa. Uh -huh. finish him on so that I will be safe. Uh -huh. Now, Dronacharya did not do that. Uh -huh. Dronacharya considered, uh -huh. okay, one side, Drishtadyumna is born to kill me. He has come to me. I have to save my life. What is my primary duty at this point of time? My primary duty is, um, I am a Brahmana. Brahmana means I am a teacher. Patan, patan, yajan, yajan, dana, pratigraha. These are the six duties of a Brahmana. What is my duty? My duty is, if I get a suitable, uh, uh, qualified uh, disciple, then I must teach him. There is no question of refusing mm -hmm. if the disciple is qualified. Mm -hmm. He might have come to kill me, no problem. But what is my duty? I have to mm -hmm. teach him. And the result of my performance of my duty is what? I will die. But doesn't matter. For him, death is not important. Life and death are not important. important. Performance of duty is important. Why? Because Dronacharya fully well knows I am not the body, I am a spirit soul. Mm -hmm. Even if the body dies, after all, today I have two options. One is, I can refuse Drishtadyumna. I would have refused doing my duty mm -hmm. and I will anyway die one day. Mm -hmm. Another is, I can do my duty, duty. and still die. Right. Better I do my duty, duty and, and die, die than to not do my duty and still die. Still die. Mm -hmm. That was his thinking. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Dronacharya said, I find that you are qualified uh, to act as a Kshatriya, I will teach you. Yes. He did not bother about his own life. So, we can see from this that Dronacharya would not even bother about his own life when it comes to performing duty. To accuse such a person, that he, uh, uh, that he discriminated on the basis of the caste of a person is a little far-fetched. Because somebody who is for whom duty is so foremost that he doesn't even bother about his own body shows how he is out of the bodily concept of life. For a, such a person to again discriminate on the basis of the body is totally out of character. So we have to understand that there must be some other reason behind this. Now, if you look at that whole incident where Ekalavya was, uh, was asked to give his thumb by Dronacharya, what happened was... Maybe it is called nepotism or favoritism. <laughs> the, again, a person who is so much fixed on duty that yeah. he is not bothered about his own life, mm. why will he engage in nepotism? Mm. Why will he try to favor somebody mm. against another person? Not possible, no. It, it, it doesn't make sense. The, uh, Dronacharya uh, taught Drishtadyumna, who was uh, born to kill him, very well knowing that the result of his teaching Drishtadyumna will be that he will be killed by him. So, a person who is, who is not even thinking about uh, his own life, how will he think of uh, favoring somebody for something? He will only think about his duty. Now, if you look at that incident where Ekalavya came in touch with uh, Dronacharya, first of all, when he first, uh, see, when a, when, a, when a, I told you about when Drishtadyumna came to Dronacharya, Dronacharya assessed him. Mm. He saw that he is qualified and because Dronacharya is teaching the highest knowledge in terms of material knowledge, in terms of knowledge which can be used to either protect people or to harm others. Mm. Therefore, Dronacharya has a duty to assess whether his disciple will use that to protect the, uh, his praja or will he use it to harm others? Yeah, just like even today when you learn uh, martial arts, they have to take about that I'll use it only for my protection or for others', others protection, not for exactly. self-aggrandizement. Exactly. And the teacher also has to assess. Uh. Suppose one Al-Qaeda terrorist comes mm. and he tells, I want to learn uh, this one. I'm ready to take the vow. Mm. I want to learn martial arts mm. from you. Mm. Will the teacher mm. teach? Never. Is there a, you're a terrorist, why mm. should I teach? Mm. So, you're discriminating? Mm. You're not discriminating no. on the basis <laughs> of a religion or anything. Mm. You are seeing he is not qualified, he will misuse the knowledge. Mm -hmm. First time when Ekalavya came to Dronacharya, Dronacharya assessed that this man will, will put that knowledge to misuse. He could foresee that. He could foresee. Uh -huh. he, he assessed, he had his way of assessing, he assessed. Sometimes it may go wrong, mm. but it was his duty, he assessed and he, he found that he is not qualified. Mm. And that was proven later. What happened? Later when they came to the forest, what happened? They saw a dog with its mouth filled with arrows. Mm. So that actually what it showed, people glorify Ekalavya for his skill of archery. Mm. But actually if you see what happened there, mm. suppose you, you go to your home and your neighbor has a dog. 
and that dog's barking is uh, is uh, bothering yeah. you what you will do you take a stone and pelt it at the dog dog will run away mm. now if you say i am from the army i've got this uh, this uh, this uh, big ak47 machine seven. gun mm. this dog is barking let me go and use that ak47 mm. against that what will happen first thing the government will do is come and snatch the gun away from you mm. you are not qualified to use it you don't know how to use mm. this dog is barking in front of ekalavya you don't even have to pelt you just show your hand like that dog will run away why does he have to throw all the arrows into its mouth that means he does not know the value of the art of archery mm. he will misuse it he does not know how to use it mm. you cannot uh, take a, uh, the army has given the uh, a soldier an ak47 his he, uh, he has to use it responsibly if he if he goes around shooting dogs on the street the, naturally the government will say you are not qualified to this one similarly ekalavya such a great uh, knowledge it is the art of archery meant for protecting citizens and in vedic uh, times even animals born in the kingdom are called praja they are mm. also praja the word praja means mm. one who is born in a place mm. jayate mm. means takes takes birth anybody who takes birth within the kingdom is called a praja it may be a plant it may be a fish it may be an animal it may be a human being everyone has an equal right to be protected and to live his life in the kingdom of uh, where varnashrama dharma is practiced that's the duty of a king to protect even animals unfortunately in today's world we talk about so much about rights of human beings we never talk about the rights of the mm. poor animals in the vedic times even animals were recognized it was recognized that even animals have the right to live therefore a kshatriya had to protect even the animals mm. so that dog was a praja in that area where ekalavya was it was his praja it was his duty to protect that animal not to create a situation where put arrows into his mouth it cannot eat it will die of starvation mm. what has it done for what what mistake it barked therefore dronacharya's assessment was correct that this man was incapable of putting that knowledge to good use and therefore he foresaw if this continues today it is a dog tomorrow it will be something else finally mm. even human beings will start doing this mm. he thought better to stop him right now no he didn't kill him no mm. he only said take away his thumb so that he will not uh, uh, he will not have the ability to shoot arrows then uh, mm. he, the matter is solved he could have asked his for his head also mm. he didn't do that he said give me your thumb as long as you are not misusing this knowledge it's enough for me over and above this you have to understand one more thing when dronacharya has refused to teach him he still put his bust mm. and started learning mm. what is that when the guru has said i will not teach you you have to respect the guru's word mm. and stay away this man ekalavya he had no respect for dronacharya's words yes. he was calling him as guru mm. but guru's instruction is not following no, no, no. guru ra bagnya mm. so he is he is he is mm. going against the guru's words so all these show that he that ekalavya was not a person who could who had finer understanding of these concepts mm. and how to properly utilize the knowledge of warfare in the in the in the uh, uh, welfare of the citizens to protect them mm. so therefore dronacharya had to take such a step otherwise it was not in uh, dronacharya's character to do such things because although his own son ashwatthama was there mm. still he taught arjuna so many things which he did not teach ashwatthama mm. ashwatthama he taught him how to release the brahmastra how to retrieve it he did not teach mm. whereas arjuna knew that mm. so like that and and he made dronacharya without considering his own son he made arjuna the greatest warrior mm. dronacharya could have thought i will teach arjuna a little lesser mm. let my son become prominent mm. he didn't do that he didn't do so, nepotism in that sense so in how, how sense. can you accuse mm. him of uh, favoring arjuna in the mm. case of ekalavya you have to see the whole character of the mm. person also mm. no? what his actions are so that way when we see we can understand that there was a deeper purpose behind Uh, dronacharya's actions if you see all these controversies of mahabharata ramayana there is one thing very common line they just want to mis represent that leela or want to drive over their agenda so what is the reason well, for this uh, it will be difficult to say whether it is agenda driven there may be some cases like that also genuinely some people cannot understand also hmm. they you know it's not, these things are all not easily comprehensible to the common man hmm. you you need to approach a bona fide uh, parampara and uh, understand a bona fide acharya if you approach then you will be able to understand all this can you put some light on parampara and understanding of through so them, the the point how is how important it is knowledge 
whenever it has to be received, it has to be received through a teacher. For example, if I want to become a doctor, what I can do, I can go to the shop and I can ask them what is the syllabus of uh, the MBBS four years. And these are the syllabus and there are recommended textbooks by all the books from the shop. Go and sit at home and study everything. Will I become a doctor? Never. So what I have to do to become a doctor? I have to go to a college. Mm. Learn the same books from a teacher. Mm. Then only I'll get a certificate that I'm a doctor. Mm. What, what is the difference? Same textbooks. Mm. Same thing I'm studying. Mm. Now why I'm, uh, I'm studying the same to uh, textbook which the, uh, that guy is sitting in the college and studying. So why are you telling I'm not bona fide doctor? Because although theoretically everything may be in writing, the context, the application, there are so many things which the teacher has to teach you. Yeah. Only when you receive that knowledge, although it is that knowledge database is there, only when you receive it from the teacher, then only you become a qualified uh, knower of that subject matter. Whether it's a doctor, it's an engineer, whoever it is. Mm. If I, if I uh, declare myself to be a doctor and you come to me and you ask, uh, oh, you have done MBBS? Yes, yes, I have done MBBS. So which college did you study? I did not go to any college. I studied <laughs> on my own. What will you do? You'll run away. Mm. <laughs> That's the wise thing to do, isn't it? You should not get treated by such a person. So the same book somebody reads under a teacher, then you accept, oh, he's a bona fide mm. Knowledge always has to be received from a teacher. And that teacher in, should, in turn should have received it from another no teacher. teacher. Who in turn should have re received it from another teacher. Like that it has to go. Mm -hmm. Then only you call it a bona fide uh, this one. Similarly, spiritual knowledge also has to be obtained from a bona fide teacher of that knowledge. From an expert on that subject matter. Mm -hmm. So such personalities are called Acharyas. Mm -hmm. And for Acharyas, there is something known as a Guru Parampara. Mm -hmm. Like Srila Prabhupada, his Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada, he is a bona fide Acharya. His Guru was His Divine Grace, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. His Guru was uh, Srila Gaurakeshwar Das Babaji Maharaj, whose Guru was Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, whose Guru was Jagannath Das Babaji Maharaj. Like this, we can actually trace back whose Guru, His Guru, His Guru, you can trace back originally it goes and ends in Krishna. Mm -hmm. And Srila Prabhupada is the 32nd in that line of Guru Parampara. This is the way spiritual knowledge has to be received, which Krishna also explains in the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Evam parampara praptam imam rajarshyo viduhu. This is the way to receive transcendental spiritual knowledge. Mm -hmm. If you don't Although receive, the book is there, then you'll be. Although the book mm -hmm. is there, everything is written in, mm -hmm. uh, in writing. Mm -hmm. All it, all it, it may be in Sanskrit. You can go to a college, learn Sanskrit and read the Bhagavad Gita on your own. But Krishna in that very Bhagavad Gita, although everything is in black and white, the whole world has access to the text of Bhagavad Gita. Still Krishna says, Raja Vidya, Raja Guhyam. This is the most confidential secret. This is the king of secrets. How can you call it secret? You can go to walk into any shop, bookshop and ask for Bhagavad Gita, you'll get a copy. How can it be a secret? Secret means something locked up somewhere which nobody has access to. But Krishna is saying, this is Raja Guhyam, this is the king of secrets. Why? Until and unless you approach a bona fide Acharya like Srila Prabhupada and understand from him what Krishna is saying, he will not be able to understand. Mm. That is why it's the most confidential of secrets. That's why Oppenheimer or the great politicians of the modern India couldn't understand the essence of Gita, the purpose or the intent of the Gita. The, so, because unless you approach a bona fide Acharya, you cannot understand. Mm. That's, the, that's, the, that's the way... Knowledge, that's, that's the nature of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like I gave the, uh, even, even a, you know, you, you can take a book on swimming and go on studying mm -hmm. it. But you have to go to an instructor and learn from him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then only, then only, otherwise, uh, what is your bookish knowledge? It's of no use. Since you come to the Bhagavad Gita topic, a verse from Bhagavad Gita which says women and chudra are also in the same platform. So, how is that Krishna is discriminating women? Okay. This is the most controversial thing okay. that generally we come Krishna across. says, uh, uh, Striyo Vaishya Satha Shudra Stepi Anti Param Gati. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the first line of the verse? Uh, Papa Yona Yaha. Papa Yone, uh -huh. Those who are Papa Yuni, those who are born in uh, lower uh, this one, whether they are women, Shudras uh, or uh, anybody even lower than them, what does Krishna say? Krishna says, even they are eligible to get the highest knowledge. So Krishna is not discriminating saying, these are women, these are Shudras. You cannot have this knowledge. That's not what Krishna said. But Krishna is telling their Papa Yonish. 
Yeah. No, Krishna said, even if you are considered a woman or a Shudra or a Papa Yoni, you can still achieve the highest knowledge. What is Krishna saying? It's like saying that uh, you may be a criminal, you may be a you may be a fraud, you may be a cheater, but you have the 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 right to get reformed and become a normal citizen. Mm -hmm. So if I'm saying mm -hmm. even if you're a criminal, if you're this, that, I'm discriminating. I'm mm -hmm. not discriminating. Mm -hmm. I'm saying even if the society has rejected you, saying you're a criminal, you are this, that, I am ready to Accepting. reform you and, uh, and bring you back to the normal society. So Krishna is saying in the society's eyes, you may be considered a woman, you may be considered a Shudra, you may be considered a Papa Yoni, all of these you may be considered. But if you come to me, I'll give you the highest, uh, this one. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the highest destination, highest goal of life. Krishna is not discriminating. We have discriminated in the society. Krishna is saying, even if society has discriminated with you, okay. I will not discriminate. Mm -hmm. That is what Krishna is saying. Mm -hmm. If Krishna had said, all of you people, don't read the Bhagavad Gita, it's not for you. Mm -hmm. Then it's discrimination. Krishna didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Even if the society has rejected, you are a Papa Yoni, you are, a, you are the biggest criminal. You are the most uh, uh, Papa Atma. You, you are not uh, fit for understanding Vedic knowledge. Get out of here. Don't be in the society. Be in the jail. Mm -hmm. Krishna is saying, even you, if you surrender, I am ready to take you away. That is a mercy. Take you back to Godhead. Mm -hmm. So Krishna is open. He is opening out. Uh, when doors have got, when the society has closed its doors on somebody, Krishna is saying, I am opening the door. So, in the society, so that raises the question. So, that means were the women uh, uh, discriminated against in the society at that time? Mm -hmm. That's not the truth because we have to understand that the, 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 uh, uh, the Vedic, the Varnashrama system had a, 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 a very highly structured society where every person had specific duties and roles to play in the society. Mm -hmm. So, the uh, society was structured in such a way that there was a martial class of people, they had a set of duties, there was a set of uh, uh, Vaisyas or mercantile people, they had a set of duties, there were Brahmanas whose only duty was, en was to engage in deep study of the Vedic scriptures, they were not supposed to engage in any other activity. Mm. So, like this, everybody was given a specific role in the society. If it is a man, if he, he will be the son of somebody, as a son, what is his duty towards his parents? Everything is listed out. Mm -hmm. If he, this is a woman, as a wife, what are her duties? As a daughter, what are her duties? As a mother, what are her duties? Everything is listed out very clearly. Mm -hmm. So that everyone's expectation of somebody else, is his, uh, somebody whom he is known to, somebody who is his relative, the expectations are set beforehand. The father knows what I can expect from my son what I can expect from my daughter. The son knows what I can expect from my father. Daughter knows what I can expect from my mother. Husband knows what I can expect from my wife. Wife knows what I can expect from my husband. And what are my duties towards my husband. Everybody knew everything very clearly. Mm. So what happened was the, the relationships in the society were very harmonious. Mm. In today's society, what has happened is there is no list of duties for anyone. So son thinks that uh, my parents should be like this. Mm. Parents are thinking, my duty towards my child is only this much. This much. Clash. And the parents are thinking, my son should be like this to me. Son is thinking, I should be in some other way like this with my parents. So there is a mismatch. Mm. What happens is relationship don't get along harmoniously. It's all a mismatch of expectations. If at the beginning of the relationship, both of uh, two people sit down and list down, these are all my expectations from you. And that person also says, these are what I expect from you. Both of them understand and agree. Okay, we will go as per this. There will be no problem. What happens is, two people come, into, come together. Each of them in their heart, they have a set of expectations which they have not expressed. And that person does not know what you are expecting from him. And he acts in a certain way. Mm. What happens is, your expectation gets broken. Mm. And then you say, Are Baba, my heart is broken. Break up. Break up. <laughs> So in the Vedic society, there was no breakup at all. Why? Because both of them understood this much I can expect. This is the line. Beyond that, I cannot expect. And the other person also knows these are the things what I have to perform. So everybody, very, very fine way, everybody knew what are his duties and responsibilities. Women had a certain role in the society. Men had a certain role. Even amongst men and women, there were gradations according to their spiritual understanding. As I, Shudra, 
vaisya kshatriya brahmana this eternal principle uh, is not practically applicable for this age right no, in Chatur today's Varna. age those things are not applicable because today what we think is the the brahmana kshatriya vaisya shudra is by birth and it is for the for the purpose of uh, some people exploiting somebody else saying that you are inferior subordinate and i am superior and to take extra facilities extract extra facilities yeah, that's what to serve the higher three classes that, that, that kind of thinking is there but reality is in the varnashrama system the gradations are based upon the extent of your renunciation extent of your vairagya in your heart mm. why is the brahmana most highly revered because brahmana is the most renounced person mm. amongst the brahmana also there are four categories there was there is silonchana there is other category so silonchana means a brahmana he what he does is he will go to the marketplace mm -hmm. and in the marketplace uh, uh, wherever reject uh, grains have fallen on the ground in front of the shop he will collect all that and with that he will live mm -hmm. so this requires a certain amount of uh, vairagya and not that he he has no ability to earn or something like that he ha he wants to voluntarily he is keeping himself like that so that he is free to think of higher uh, spiritual subject matter he he can think of studying the vedas and all those kind of things now little higher than that is a person who will go to the agricultural field and there during the season whatever the uh, uh, the farmer has uh, harvested the crop after that whatever is left on the ground he will take that mm -hmm. so crop is not getting harvested every day in the market every day grains are getting sold some grains you can collect these are the standard of, of brahmana so a brahmana, brahmana who is who is who is practicing that going to the field and taking the brahmana who is going to the market he will respect him higher mm -hmm. he is considered higher mm -hmm. so like this you know there are gradations even within that mm -hmm. the each person who practices higher and higher things greater and greater vairagya he is considered even mm -hmm. superior so brahmana was respected so highly in the society because he was so renounced mm -hmm. and because he was so renounced so kshatriya is a little less renounced but he is ready to give up his life yeah. to protect mm -hmm. others that much he is ready to that extent he has vairagya now a vaisya doesn't have that much vairagya he, he mm -hmm. if you tell him to fight in a battle he will run away mm -hmm. he will say no my life is more important mm -hmm. kshatriya means i am ready to give up my life mm -hmm. brahmana means i am i am not interested in anything mm -hmm. related to the body mm -hmm. he has given up everything you put him in front of the battlefield he will say Aram, enemy come and kill me i will not object mm -hmm. he is that renounced mm -hmm. kshatriya is not that renounced mm -hmm. he will fight mm -hmm. and after fighting he is killed okay mm -hmm. brahmana means he will not fight you want to kill me kill me no problem mm -hmm. so he is so much renounced mm -hmm. now vaisya is not that much renounced vaisya what he will do he will give away in charity his money mm -hmm. to that extent he is renounced mm -hmm. so therefore kshatriya is higher than a vaisya brahmana is higher than a kshatriya now a shudra he he will not give in donation mm -hmm. he will not give in charity he will say no 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 this is mine i will not give so vaisya is higher than him mm -hmm. so in the varnashrama system somebody is called higher and somebody is called lower on the basis of the extent of renunciation mm -hmm. on the extent of how much vairagya he has developed mm -hmm. it's not for artificial oppression of one caste or for uh, for domination over the others it so is what happened was that. that in the medieval age of but unfortunately that happened it uh, actually uh, happened like uh, that why because unqualified people claimed on the basis of birth birth that i am a brahmana i am a kshatriya mm. naturally because they are unqualified they started exploiting mm. the lower people so it currently it doesn't have any meaning in that it sense it doesn't too. have a meaning yeah. it is a vitiated corrupted form of the original varnashrama system mm -hmm. but because krishna says in the bhagavad gita chatur varnyam maya srishtam guna karma vibhagasah according to the qualities and nature of a person and his activities these four divisions of brahmana kshatriya vaisya shudra have been created by the supreme lord and incorporated into the fabric of this material universe mm -hmm. in the human society mm -hmm. therefore that can never be destroyed that means you, it does exist you mean to it say it exists in a corrupted form in a perverted form mm -hmm. you can never destroy it completely mm -hmm. if the original is not there in a perverted form it will continue mm -hmm. therefore this by birth caste system it will continue you cannot destroy it. Mm -hmm. why because ultimately chatur varna cannot be destroyed varnashrama cannot be destroyed it will continue even if you say hindus don't exist all hindus are wiped out still in the society there will be military mm -hmm. there will be economy mm -hmm. there will be uh, uh, there will be uh, labor class you know uh, labor class mm -hmm. and uh, there will be uh, uh, and there will mm. be uh, people philosophers and uh, uh, knowledge uh, mm. uh, this one uh, you know people who are uh, dealing with knowledge so these four classes will always remain. by default they exist they they are they are inbuilt into mm. this creation they are inbuilt into the human society fabric mm. you cannot remove it from mm. the human mm. society's fabric
it will exist in some way or the other mm -hmm. so but then original form when it was there when everything was properly uh, uh, properly delineated as to whose responsibility is what then the whole society could function in a well oiled manner mm -hmm. now also society is functioning but too much of friction mm -hmm. one uh, uh, politician takes a decision all the uh, uh, industry body members will come and uh, uh, they will uh, mm -hmm. Uh, they will act against it. The philosophers, the so-called, uh, the, the intellectual class, they'll uh, come and all the activists, they'll come and do a dharna. Mm. So a lot of friction in society. Why? Mm. Because nobody, the activist is expecting something from the government. Government is expecting something from the society. Mm. It's uh, not matching. Mm. It's clashing. Uh, Solution. Conflicts are coming out. Solution. Solution right. is only to chant Hare Krishna. Because in Kali Yuga, there is no question of bringing back the old Varnashrama mm -hmm. system. That's dead and gone. Dead and gone. Okay. Only way is when we chant Hare Krishna, what will happen is we start acting on the platform of the spirit soul, not on the body. The body, I may be born in a Brahmana family, Kshatriya family, Shudra family, Vaishya family, it doesn't matter. If I am working on the platform of being a spirit soul, a servant, eternal servant of Krishna, then everybody else becomes my brother and sister because mm -hmm. our common father is Krishna. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? The whole society can again become harmonious and peaceful instead of uh, giving rise to conflicts like what we witness today. Practically, how is it possible? It's a wonderful practically, statement. Which you practically, simple thing. Everybody has to take up chanting Hare Krishna. We have to spread Sankirtana everywhere. That's all. Mm -hmm. Then you will see the magic happen. Mm -hmm. Didn't the Hare Krishna uh, uh, mantra work magic in your and my lives? Yes. We were also like the common people in the outside world. We also had our aspirations, ambitions. And we also we used to think this fellow in my college, you know, somehow this fellow I don't like. I have to do something against him. We were also engaging in all that. Mm. But now when we have started chanting Hare Krishna, what has happened? Our hearts have transformed. Mm. So this is, the, this is the effect of the Hare Krishna mantra. Because it is completely spiritual, transcendental. Simply chant the Hare Krishna mantra, engage in Sankirtana Ajna. Rest, everything will follow. So thank you so much, Prabhu, for uh, My taking pleasure. out your time and uh, answering all these controversial questions. Uh, that perspective in which you presented is very imperative and important for Krishna conscious devotees, folks and others to understand this. Thank you so much once again. My uh, pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai.